who did his Harvard uh, thesis on Flannery O'Connor. Conan O'Brien, who did his Harvard thesis on Flannery O'Connor. Um, uh, Alice Walker, who wrote this beautiful essay about, so we just went around, anytime we thought Hilton Alice, who's in the New Yorker right now, by the way, uh, on a Flannery O'Connor thing. Um, so that's, so that's what the other part of the film was uh, just that kind of stuff. So th that's why you see all that kind of difference. Somewhere in there, somebody said, they just think contemporary writers that sustain their faith. Yeah. Can you comment on that? I, yeah, I mean, what we love, the, what we love about, what I love about Flannery O'Connor is that, is this kind of um, intellectual uh, and emotional and spiritual kind of, kind of harmony in her faith. And I think that she came of a time when there was this, what we might call a Catholic revival and uh, people like Thomas Aquinas reinterpreted by, through Jacques Maritain and this kind of idea of art and faith working. And she just kind of came at this right time and could put it all together. And I think what Alice McDermott, who was a Catholic writer in, in, outside of Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, what she was trying to say is that, that she, she's, she's sui generis, she's unique. Uh, some people would say that it's, there are a group of critics who would say, you know, there's a, we could start canonizing Flannery O'Connor. There's something so uniquely heroic about her faith. Um, a lot of other critics say, don't ever do that, don't ever do that, right? It, it'll make her seem like she's not important. The Dorothy Day's line, you know, um, don't, don't canonize me because no, everybody will forget me, you know, I forget my, what I do. Um, so I do think in that regard, and I think, I think Alice McDermott is right. I think that um, when I read her, I'm in awe the same way that Alice McDermott is. I have two graduate doctoral students who finished their uh, doctorates, and they all have a chapter on Flannery O'Connor, and they both say this. Every, they always keep her letters, the habit of being, by their bedside. And they, when they finish reading it, they start over again. They both did it four or five years apart. Their wives tell me that they did this. They say, yeah, I have to go to bed with Flannery O'Connor on a bedside all the time. Because I, he reads two or three le letters, and at the end of this 800 pages, he goes back again. So there's something about her that the intellectual, the spiritual, and the emotional just comes together. Now these were the interviews with Alice Walker, Hilton Alls, uh, McDermott, Mary Gordon. Those were all contemporary that we've done, the three of us have done in the last few years. McDermott, Tommy Walker, Lee Tommy Lee Jones, Michael Fitzgerald, Tobias Wolf. Tobias Wolf. I mean, you can if you look closely, you can kind of you can tell which films are pre-digital, 20 years old, and you know they're a little a little grainier. But she can tell actually. I couldn't I tell, tell very well because she's I, I'm the geek and she's the doc, they're the documentarians who have the art. In it's their amazing hands. how well the interviews have held up, and it's a testament to Christopher Hare who did a great job. And and truly these. Uh, we're donating, the, the interviews will all be donated because scholars will love working with them. I mean, the Sally Fitzgerald interview alone is um, We have 20, really 28 hours of film in a 97, so I can imagine a scholar or just anybody wanting to come and see just that, that conversation that they have. Because you, you kind of get the, the tenor of the friendship over a two hour, three hour interview that Chris did. Way in the back, oh, way in the back and yeah. then we'll go this way. I just want to know where you got the inspiration to close it out with Bruce Springsteen's The Rest. <laughs> you know, it just seemed like the perfect thing to do. Honestly, of course we wanted to interview Bruce, right? So you know Bruce Springsteen said in a New York Times uh, piece that he, he wrote Nebraska after, and this is my favorite part, after re-reading Flannery O'Connor. Not just reading Flannery O'Connor, but re-reading Flannery O'Connor. And so Nebraska is a kind of tribute. His inspiration came from, from those readings. And so we had, to have, we had to have Bruce there. But Bruce wouldn't um, it, uh, get fit for an interview because he's on Broadway and he doesn't do interviews while he's on Broadway. Yeah, but Lucinda Williams, who yeah. met Flannery, uh, her work's also in there. And um, her father, a poet, um, was, was a, great friend. a great friend and inspired by O'Connor. And Lucinda has written... So we have her song inspired directly by O'Connor. So a lot of, I mean, we've talked to people who are interested in us releasing a soundtrack album because so many musicians have been inspired by her, and, and we have a couple in there. 
Yes. <laughs> Can I set you up? Certainly, go. Um, she has worked so hard on, on sewing things together. In fact, last night we added a sound of the crutches. Uh, so it's like a painting. And so Flannery's painting is a metaphor for filmmaking, if you can, if you can get away with it. I think academic professors, we, 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 have a, we have a day job, so we, we have much more flexible time, very different way of working. Um, but Elizabeth is, is uh, it's inter it'll be interesting when she stops working on it, but she, she, I'm setting her up to talk about this process uh, because it's, it's very involved, but it is broken down into different aspects of it. But yeah, tell, tell her the timeline. That's so sweet of you, honey. <laughs> um, well, there are a number of issues, right? First, there's just the one television interview of Flannery, and then there's the one childhood British pate with the duck walking, I mean, the chicken walking backwards. There's the only two moving image archival pieces of Flannery, and then there are not many photographs of her either. And, I mean, we included, really, we included every photograph we could possibly get. Yeah. So we were... We even found some that we made. They were, it, it was still in the film, and we actually developed those, those kind of real hazy ones, those cloudy ones. That, that was still in a camera we, in the archives, and we actually had those developed. So. Well, and I, I think, you know, so the blurry photographs, doing a biography is so much about trying to bring someone into focus, and... Because O'Connor started as a cartoonist and was a painter and was very much a visual artist, it made sense for us yeah. both to visualize and illustrate her fiction with some motion graphics and animation. And we have three wonderful female animators who did incredible work. Um, and to try to use illustrations and graphics in a way that suggests we are, we're trying to see her, it's so hard to see her and find out who she is. Uh, but those were really some of our guiding principles with, uh, with trying to bring a biography together. I would say that we wanted to talk to, about her being a woman in the South who was, you know, who was a serious artist that she was a white woman in the South dealing with race uh, and that disability was part of her life and so we wanted to show how, in some ways, how, how present she is to our own experience uh, today. Uh, and I think that that was ways in which, really, Elizabeth puts together the, the footage to kind of keep those things in balance. And I, I think you did a great job. Well, thank you. We, we use a lot of archival footage, too, and we really worked hard. I had, we had two archival researchers assist us uh, with trying to find archival footage that had just the right kind of O'Connor darkness and humor to it and weirdness as well as, um, you know, we, we, the footage really is almost all from Georgia and of the era. So the Klan footage, the creepy induction ceremony that we got from CBS. So we spent a lot of time, again, because we did not have many photographs of her or interviews with her of trying to find footage that really reminded us of her, um, you know, her intellect as well as her sentiment. I think you're, I think you're. I, I wanted to ask you to frame the issue of race and mystery across both which interviews you decided to keep in, mm -hmm. and also the idea that it was such a great one to watch and wonder Okay. It almost seems like in the film you resist ever closing her down and so that you allow her to remain, I would say theologically, someone who surrenders but still has the mystery mm -hmm. of that race. And I just wondered how much of that was conscious or if you had a way to say it better or more. Oh. Ah. That's a nice comment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, I'm I'm actually touched that I mean we, we that you say that we 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 struggle with how do we make her Catholicism uh, part of her story not just for Catholics but for I mean if 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 this goes right we know this will be at a national broadcast right so how do we get this through a whole swath of of folks um, and 
and how do we kind of represent through images, through going through the churches and things like that? How do we kind of keep on circling back to Grace uh, and even, you know, the, her, her illness? I think she comes to a conclusion that that is itself as a grace, there, and there's something there. Um, there's a great humility about Flannery O'Connor, um, and humility is itself mysterious and graceful. And she's one of those, there is not anybody who's met her that didn't really, you know, find her a, a moving person. I mean, we can't find anybody who says, oh, yeah, Flannery O'Connor. I mean, there's nothing out there. Uh, and so I think that, that that humility itself is a kind of a, a mystery and a grace that kind of is woven through her life. But and thank you for that. She's stoic. She is strong. She was on crutches most of her adult life, but never, ever felt sorry for herself. And, you know, she knew she was smart. She knew she was a damn good writer. And, you know, if you wanted to try to pull one over on her, good luck with that. I mean, she really, um, her faith was part of, a big part of her strength uh, as well as her intellect. And to try to convey both of those things, we think her fiction, her writing, and her letters uh, do that better than anything. And uh, we've tried to do a little bit of that in the film. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lucinda Williams' father taught here at Loyola. Oh. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Uh, why, are, why are you showing this film here? <laughs> We are showing this film because you invited us, Tom. Um, and uh, Sonia O'Connor actually did speak here. Um, the last place she spoke was Georgetown. Uh, her last uh, her last lecture uh, she gave. But um, no, we're, we're we're just trying this out and are trying to see. You know, um, to be honest with you, I was really happy that you were laughing with the places where I hope you were laughing. And even more importantly, you were not laughing when you were supposed to not be laughing. So, uh, so but there is that sense that uh, just to, to, I mean, I think that she really speaks to, um, you know, uh, a, a Catholic community, but not just to a Catholic community. So uh, being at Loyola has been great. When, when was she here, you know? It was, uh, I think it was 59 or 60. It was right after uh, Walker Percy won the uh, National Book Award. Um, because she mentions it after she had been here, and I think it was 1960, so it must have been 1960. Do you have a view as to personal influence was on Catholicism? Um, yeah, what, was the, what, was the, what was the signature influence on her Catholicism as an intellectual? Principal influence. Prince, pr um, I think, uh, in terms of, of intellectual people, um, I think Jacques Maritain was probably the biggest influence on her thinking about her craft as a act of God, as a work of God. And, um, and this idea that beauty um, is part of the theological category of, of her life. And um, trying to find beauty in very grotesque ways was her way of doing it. But I would think, I really do think Jacques, Mar but you know, she read Heidegger, the minute Heidegger was, was, was um, uh, translated um, in 1950. I mean, she was, re I mean, she was reading, she was reading uh, Camus. Um, so it was not just Catholics, but I think that, it, I really do think it was Maritain and Thomas Aquinas. She says that um, she uh, basically read Thomas Aquinas every night. That was her bedtime reading, and um, yeah. So she really found something intellectual, intellectually stimulating about that. One, one more questions, one then two. I know that one of her quotes is that she was, I can't remember, you all might remember, she said something, made uh, a joke about the Eucharist, that she said about her being a symbol, and she said, well, she's a symbol of color. Right. And I remember being in college and writing a paper about the country people. That really struck me as, you know, how firm and her faith she was. Because she didn't make any apologies. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think I did a beautiful job of conveying that, and I don't think it was a gun. You can't talk about Flannery O'Connor without talking about it. Right. It's impossible. Right. Like, I mean, you could, yeah. you know, but there's yeah. an element of the life. Right. There's just so much stuff it, that we could have put in this film, and we had that in. We had, we this, had that story. We struggled, oh my gosh, just to get it down to this amount of time. But we did have some of that stuff in the film at the beginning one time. One last question. Just,
Um, and on that point, it, that's a one uh, an earlier question is like how, how did we go about structuring the material? Um, one thing that was really important for me as a visual as a photographer and and sound designer was to try to embody to walk in her shoes, um, sit where she sat, look where she looked. And I urge you know if you haven't been to Milledgeville, um, it's it's interesting to to go there and to let even today in a modern sense sort of let things work on you and and keep her reading in mind and sort of let 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 something kind of happen internally and and it was it was interesting and I think the Alice Walker section was was very fascinating for us as well because it is very close um, where she where she lived was just just up the road so yeah. But Alice Walker said uh, in her great essay about going to visit uh, Flannery's house with her mother one time, Alice Walker says, but I'm going to tell the other side of the story. Okay. Um, well, th thank you all again. Thank you. Um, do you want to do this? Um, the, uh, w this has been a Lenten gift. So thank you for the gift uh, to Loyola, and, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight, uh, and uh, have a good evening.